Hello and welcome to this edition of Reading the Bible with Meaning. We uh, are in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. And this time we are going to be taking a look at Revelation chapter 9. And uh, the action is going to slow down a little bit in this chapter. Uh, but we'll pick up again uh, as we move through chapter 9 and into chapter 10. But as we begin to look at this together, let's begin, uh, as always, with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I do pray for your spirit in this time of study. Lord, guide and direct us by your spirit of inspiration and knowledge and understanding. Lord, help us first to discover what these words meant as they were originally heard and Lord, then how to apply them to our lives today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to take a look again at Revelation chapter 9. And um, before we do that, I do want to again remind us of what's been going on in these chapters. Uh, beginning in chapter 6, we moved into three what I would consider to be parallel visions. So a vision of a series of events looked at from three different perspectives. So as we moved through uh, the first seven seals, we saw what happened at the breaking of each seal. And at the breaking of the seventh seal, we moved into the trumpet vision. And that's where we are now. The trumpet vision will carry us through the end of chapter 9. And then um, there'll be an interlude there, a fairly lengthy one, as we look at some of the events taking place. But uh, we looked at the first five trumpets last time in chapter 8. And uh, we're going we're gonna to move into the sixth and uh, seventh trumpets um, in this chapter. And then again... Um, take a little bit of an interlude and look at some other events that John will see happening both on earth and in heaven. So uh, that's where we are. We're in the trumpet visions, recapitulating what we've seen already in the first vision, but looking at it now from a different perspective. And that'll make sense here uh, in just a minute. But uh, remember that the narrative of the trumpet judgment sequence describes the first four trumpet plagues in six verses. That's the end of uh, chapter 8. The two woes uh, that accompany the sixth and seventh trumpets uh, are just, take an entire chapter to describe 21 verses. And that emphasizes the seriousness of what follows. So in the seal judgments, the first the first vision, the focus was on how these judgments affected nature or creation. Uh, this set, uh, in particular the woes, uh, describe the torments humanity will experience because of those judgments. Now, we have to understand that this is not just judgment. There's more going on here. This is why it's so important to have some understanding of the preaching of the prophets and the teaching of the prophets in the Old Testament, because it's never just about judgment. It's also about warning. Uh, there would be no point in walking through all of this stuff if there wasn't some expected response on the part of humanity to the calamities that are afflicting it. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Now, we do want to also be clear that non-believers are the focus here, and that's indicated a couple of ways grammatically in the narrative. When you see a statement like, only those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, we're looking at uh, humankind apart from believers, okay? Apart from those who have committed their life to God. They're the ones who will experience torments, suffering, and death. Again, not just judgment, but warning. We also see words like people or humankind, humanity, mankind, man. 
Those words are also intentionally used to talk about the non-believing world. And to drill it down even a little bit more, the word is applied to exclusively to those who are in outright rebellion against God. So we're not talking about people who are just ignorant, who don't know, who haven't heard. That's a different category. We're talking about people who have heard, understand, okay, and intentionally reject these words, inject, reject this, uh, what the rejected God, reject God, uh, just narrow it down to that, right? So, as we move into the actual judgments, the actual text, we're in chapter 9, verse 1, okay? So, hang on tight, things are about to get a wee bit crazy, but we're going to unpack this, okay? So, resuming the action, the fifth angel blew his trumpet, it says in chapter 9, verse 1, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Now, again, look at the narrative. Look at the words, the pronouns that are used, okay? A star fallen from heaven, and he was given. Now, the phrase, a star is fallen, a star which had just fallen, or a star which is had just been falling i'm trying i'm struggling with that because the, the 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 greek conveys an active sense not a passive sense and that word has a range of meaning more often than not talking about destruction or something being thrown but here uh, it's almost as if this star has some control over its falling now, it's also in what's called the dramatic perfect tense. So, perfect tense is used to speak about something that's complete, okay? Uh, and it's dramatic because it's supposed to indicate something vivid, something certain that is going to occur, okay? To say that tomorrow morning at sunrise, the sun will have risen, okay, is, is future perfect, but it's, it, it's, it speaks of a future event as if it has already taken place. I hope that makes sense. Now we saw another fallen star back in the last chapter. But that was a meteor. That was an it, not a he. This star is a person, a being of some sort, a fallen star. That's something that we, even in outside of, of uh, the believing world, we recognize this idea of, of a fallen star, okay? Uh, and he, the fallen star, was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit or abyss. The word can be translated both ways. Now, to connect it to a person is not unique to John, okay? Isaiah fourteen twelve portrays the king of Babylon as a fallen star. How you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. Okay, talking about the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. How, are, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid nations low. So it's talking about you know, someone who has fallen from a high place, both literally and figuratively. To say that the king of Babylon was a fallen star is to say that he went from his high place of authority and rule to a low place, okay, of no authority and no rule. First Enoch, again, we're, I'm looking at some of these extra biblical books as they're called. First Enoch 21 6 describes the fallen angels as stars of heaven which have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and are bound here till 10,000 years, the time entailed by their sins are consumed, right? So, talking about some sort of a heavenly being that's been cast out of heaven. We're, we're accessing ancient cosmology, okay? Now, you have to understand it. You have to believe it this way. Science, you know, has all kinds of things to say about stars and why they fall. We call them meteors, right? Falling stars. But in the ancient cosmologies of the world, the ancient uh, ways of looking at the universe, there's there's... The, the skies were not just a place of bodies, uh, different things up there, right? But they're the place where the deity, deities dwell. 
So stars were early on in ancient animistic religions. Stars were identified as divine beings, and a fallen star, therefore, was a far that, star, that, a being that fell or was cast to the earth. That's how they understood it in the ancient world. Again, you just have to understand that, okay? It's real important. Um, Luke 10, 18, right? All the way in, even into the New Testament, there's this understanding of beings up above us who fall to heaven. And by the way, being cast out of the heavens to the earth was not considered a good thing, right? It's a punishment, <laughs> uh, which is just interesting. But Luke is this story of Jesus sending out either 70 or 72 of his followers. It depends on how you translate the Greek, but in pairs uh, to kind of herald his arrival in the towns and villages of Galilee. And Jesus gave them power and authority to perform miracles in his name. And they did that. And they preached and people uh, came to faith. And to use yeah, an anachronistic term, but they came to faith in Jesus. And the disciples returned and gave Jesus this report. And he's overjoyed. And he said he saw Satan fall like lightning from the heaven. To say, not, you know, to say symbolically that this is a great victory over Satan. And again, Jewish thought and, and many religions of, in the ancient world you, you looked at stars as symbols of divine or, or human beings in the sky. Okay, So that's just important. Now, the bottomless pit, right? But what does the star symbolize? Right, A fallen angel, maybe. One of the stars swept to earth by the tail of the dragon in chapter 12, maybe. But if fallen, if we look at fallen, in an active sense, right? Something that is a, so, sort of a controlled fall. We can, we can, in the active tense, we can legitimately translate that word descended. So a star that descended, and if that we look at it that way and we see it as its origin is in heaven, then what that tells us is that the star is an angel as a divine agent of God, not someone cast out of heaven, but someone sent to heaven by God with a mission. And so once we look at what this angel does, that becomes a little bit more clear, a more plausible explanation. Also, we have this statement that this fallen, falling star was given a key given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And a key is a symbol of authority, okay? The authority to open and close, okay? So the angel who comes down of heaven carrying the key to the abyss, right? We're going to see again in chapter 20, okay? So verse 2, what does the angel do with the key? He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened from the smoke of the shaft. So let's dig into what this bottomless pit or abyss may be. Think about that. Again, first Enoch, we get a lot of this imagery from First Enoch especially. First uh, Enoch 21.7 describes the final prison of fallen angels as a place where a great fire burned. And where do we get our pictures or images of hell? A lot, some of it comes from the Bible, but some of it also comes from these extra-biblical works like First Enoch. So what does First Enoch say in, this, in his vision? Also, I inspected in another horrifying place, and I beheld horrifying things. He's, he's looking into this, this place, a great fire burning and blazing there. And the place had, as far as the abyss, full and great pillars of fire descending. Now their measurement or width was I able to see or to guess. So this great place with fire, pillars of fire burning. And, you know, pillars of fire, you should immediately think, right? The Exodus wandering. Uh, I think we'll get to that in a minute. But seven of the nine references to a bottomless pit or abyss in Scripture are in Revelation. I think that's interesting because, you see, Revelation is about judgment and redemption. 
Okay. Redemption means nothing if there are not some who are unredeemed or, in a sense, maybe unredeemable, okay? Who refuse. This is the great refusal that we see in Revelation, the great refusal of people to acknowledge the Lord, okay? Because they've set up in their minds this image of God that they can't believe in and therefore reject not God, but the image of God in which they choose to believe. Very interesting. So that what about this abyss? Well, it's populated, right? It's populated. It's inhabited by the scorpion army that we're going to meet in verse 7. It's the dwelling place of the beast of the abyss. And we're going to see that beast in 11, for chapter 11 and chapter 17. And in chapter 20, we learn that Satan is in prison there for a thousand years, whatever that means. We're going to talk about that too. Uh, that, that was, you know, just put that on the back burner. We'll get to that in a wee bit. Now, evil spirits, right? So this abyss is a place that in the, in the, people understood it to exist. And Jesus, right? Jesus operates out of that belief structure. Demons. It's very interesting if you look at the Gospels and you... Uh, you look at how the demons respond to Jesus without equivocation, without hesitation. All of these demons acknowledge Jesus as Lord. And it, it sets up a contrast intentionally between these demonic de be beings who instantly recognize who Jesus is and what, who he represents and his own people, the leaders of his own people, who refuse to recognize who Jesus is and who he represents. So there's this story of a demoniac, a man possessed by demons, who's wandering around in a desolate place. And Jesus shows up. And uh, this man is throffing around and carrying on. And, and Jesus asked him, what is your name? And it's not the man who responds, but the demons possessing him. And he said, legion, or many demons that entered him. Legion is that word that just says, there's a lot of us in here. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. They don't want to go back to the place that they came from, because it's a nasty place. So Jesus accommodates them and casts them into a herd of swine, which then will go over the cliff and die. So I'm not sure that was a better option, but there it is. Um, Paul, too, talks about the word abyss as the place of the dead. And I think that's interesting because I don't know that in Paul, the word has the same kind of nasty connotation. Because, of course, Paul is operating out of that ancient Jewish belief that there is a place of the dead, a place called Sheol. And it may be that that's what he is talking about when he uses this word. But in Romans 10... He said, the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. So we can't control Jesus or where he goes. We can't go where he can go okay, at this stage uh, in our existence. And what about this pit? From the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. Okay, so again, the fire and the smoke, right, uh, can be, uh, again, there's a multifaceted way to interpret these things. But rising smoke, right, or smoke enveloping a mountain or a tent or a building would be seen as an indication of the presence of the divine. So when God descended onto Mount Sinai, in Exodus 19, the mountain was wrapped in smoke. Okay. Why? Well, very important theological reason. Because to see God, for the people are obviously sinful people, right? And to see God is to die, so the, the smoke protects them from seeing God face to face. 
Um, Joel 2 describes the day of the Lord as a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, because God is descending. Now, some of the world will react with gloom and terror. Believers will at, react with joy and expectation, okay? When the day of the Lord comes, we bit of fear too. We have to face the judgment. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power, like the power of scorpions on the earth. So again, remember you see the word like, they were like something, the comparative phrase, the comparative use of the word like. And again, we, we have to have the plagues in view. It's, it's really a good idea to, to, to take a look at those passages in Exodus that talk about the plagues, because there's a lot of imagery that's borrowed from there. Um, the first uh, the Old Testament references to the plague of locusts. So in Exodus 10, the locusts came all over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been been before, nor ever will be again. That's a scary thing, right? If you're in a part of the country that has to deal with locusts um, periodically, then you know they are very destructive creatures or can be. And so in the Old Testament, they are a frequent symbol of destruction. Deuteronomy talks about it. Cricket or locust shall possess all your trees and the fruit of your ground. They decimate crops. First Kings, if there's a famine in the land, if there is pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar, if their enemy besieges them in the land of their gates, whatever plague, whatever sickness is there. So locusts are equated with famine, pestilence, blight, right? A besieging army, a plague, a sickness. So they're not, not good, right? They, or they can't, they can be, a, again, destruction. What do we know about locusts, right? Bread in the desert, but they invaded cultivated areas for food and travel in huge swarms and still do, right? Uh, there's accounts of some swarms of locusts being a hundred feet deep. Imagine that, a hundred feet deep and four miles long. Can you imagine that? How many locusts? Now, we also want to understand that they are given the power of torment, not death. Torment, not death. The torment is a warning. Torment is intended to drive people to God, okay, where they have driven themselves away from God. Now, scorpions. Now, we have locusts and with power like scorpions, again, large scorpions, common in desert areas, common in Palestine. But when we look at these things, now you can try to draw a picture. If that, you know, if that um, uh, makes you happy, um, you can try to draw a picture. But the literal appearance of these things is far less important in Revelation than what they symbolize. So the power of the locust to devour and torment the power of the scorpion to sting and harm, okay? That's, in, that's what's in view here. And their power is limited, okay? They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, right? So the idea is that God is in control of nature and, and a subtax that runs, I think, not just through revelation but through all of scripture is that nature instinctively instantly unquestioningly obeys god so these locusts and remember we're thinking about you know we think about a locust we think about a mindless insect but it's operating under god's control in egypt the plague of locusts was directed First, at nature, right, to destroy the crops, which secondarily impacted the people who rely on those crops for food. 
Here it's directed entirely toward nature. Imagine these locusts just descending on you right, and nibbling away at your skin. Torment. But when it says they were told not to do something, we're, we must automatically recognize that their power and authority is derived. They were told, right? Passive mood. And the focus, right, the, only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, right? So the focus is on those who rejected God and the call of the gospel. Again, read the story of the plagues in Egypt and, and look at what happens and what doesn't happen. Every plague strikes Egypt. Where's Israel? In Egypt but they're protected in the land of Goshen. So the plague is directed, right? These plagues are directed. They impact only the Egyptians, not the Israelites. So carrying this through, when these things happen, whatever they form, they take, the world, the non-believer will suffer from them, but the believers will not. And that's intentional. Because, and that's why one of the reasons why I believe that the church will be present in this time, not raptured away, okay? Because people will start to ask, well, why aren't you affected? Well, let me tell you, okay? Well, why is God doing these things? Why are these things happening to us? Well, let me tell you, okay? It, it's a chance for the church to witness. Will it be received? Well, by some, but not by all, okay? So, again, talking about these locusts, they were allowed to torment them for five months. We'll get to that in a minute. But not to kill them. And their torment was like the torpion, torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. Okay, so scorpion venom is nasty, but not necessarily fatal. Okay, but it's very painful. A sting of a scorpion. I don't know that personally. Hopefully never will, but I know it uh, by contact with someone who was actually stung by a scorpion. Now, what about five months? You know, in a sense, it's arbitrary. In a sense, it's not. But if we, if we step away from the literal and look first at the symbolic, what it tells us is that it is a limited but unspecified period, okay? A short time, relatively speaking. Why five months? Well, it's the average life cycle of a locust, so that's one, right? It's the length of the dry season from spring to late summer, so that's another one, right? But the point is that humanity will have an opportunity to repent before Christ returns. Old God is holding back in the hope that some will yet respond. Um, if you're walking with me through the book of Jeremiah, this will make immediate sense. God waited and waited and waited. Jeremiah prophesied for 20 years in Judah, 20 years, while God waited for his people to respond, to repent, right? So this part is interesting. Think about these tormenting, stinging, locust, scorpion things. In those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Now, in those days, when you see that word, it's a prophetic statement. Jesus uses it. The prophets use it. In those days, in that day. Okay? But the idea here, and I find this intriguing, is that in that day, it will be impossible to die. Nobody will die. Right? And we, we often look at that as a good thing. But it's a bad thing when, for people who are suffering so greatly that they want to die, okay? And the irony here is that those who sought the death of Christians, who sought to put them to death, right, to escape from their misery, will not be able to die to escape from their own. I just think that's interesting. Now you're going, well, that's kind of weird. Yeah, it is but there's a purpose to it, okay? There's an intentional contrast here between seeking death to escape so torment and welcoming death as the doorway to eternal blessing. That's the key thing here. In a culture, and we're talking about ancient Rome in that time period, 
around the first century, in a time when people, much like today, did everything they could to avoid death, right? Christians, while not, they weren't supposed to actively seek it, but they weren't necessarily supposed to actively avoid it. Because the Christians understood, the believers understood, that death was a doorway, not an end. Many people in the ancient world believed it was simply the end of existence unless you happened to be somebody great whom the Senate could vote into heaven at one of their stated meetings. I think that's hilarious. But Paul gets it, right? We live in this tension between wanting to be here to do what we need to do and wanting to be the Lord where we won't have to worry about anything. Paul said in Philippians, near the end of his life and ministry, I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, right? To be with Christ is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary in your account. So it's kind of the back and forth here. I, I know I need to be here. I know I need to be with Christ. I'm, drawn, I'm torn between the two, right? Now, let's get back to the locusts, right? Again, what does this symbolize? In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. Their hair like women's hair. Their teeth like lion's teeth. Look at that word again, like. It implies an indirect correspondence, not a direct correspondence. Okay? They're something on their head that looked like a crown of gold. Their faces looked kind of like human faces, right? Their hair was kind of like women's hair, and we'll see what that means. Their teeth kind of like lion's teeth. So what did these things mean, right? Again, don't get, don't get lost in the weeds here. The intent is to give the, the impression of something unnatural in appearance and awesome in cruelty, something big and dangerous. So it says, they're locusts who are like horses. That means they are big. Bigger than anything we've ever seen. Okay? Prepared for battle means they appear to be armored and ready for war. What's that mean, right? That suggests conquest. Again, destruction. What looked like crowns of gold. So some symbol of power and authority on them. Maybe a halo. I don't know. Could be anything. But some way to recognize that they have been given authority. I love this. Like human faces, which in, in, in Revelation symbolizes that they're intelligent and aware. So smart locusts, as big as horses, armed for battle. Right? Scary. It's meant to be. Hair like women's hair. What, what's that mean? Well, in the Old Testament, right, it means long and flowing hair, which is beauty in men, or beauty in women, but vit, vit, vitality in men. There was a time when long hair on men was accepted. It was a sign of strength, virility, vitality, right? Um, and, you know, we say... Fashions change, but um, when hair became, long hair became associated with femininity, I got the word out, right? Then all of a sudden men were told not to have long hair. Teeth like lion's teeth. Fierceness, cruelty, ferociousness, right? Something nasty. So what's the idea here? Whatever they look like, it is designed to strike terror in the hearts of all who see them. It's scary. Something we've never seen before, right? Still more descriptives. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. So locusts have wings. We, if you've been in an area that has lots of locusts, you know that sound they make. But the breastplates you got to be careful with that word. The idea here, the phrasing, indicates a coat of chain mail, not solid metal. It's a later development. 
Chainmail was early. It was it was cheaper to construct for one thing, um, but and lighter than a solid piece of metal, but very very effective. But the idea is that because they're armored, because they're wearing armor, they're invulnerable to human attack, right? And so they appear like. Uh, and they make noises like chariots, and that would be designed to strike terror in the hearts of those who heard it, right? Chariots. The Egyptians employed those chariots early on as a formidable weapon in battle. The Israelites, other cultures, adopted the chariot, okay? And armed, I mean, armed it. And so uh, it would be, the equivalent today would be a big battle tank, Right? making a lot of noise. So the chain mail as they're moving along is going to make noise. Their wings are going to make noise. They sound like chariots, right? So it's a, it's a noise designed to strike terror, to torment, okay? To drive people to their knees. Because all the convincing, right? However long this takes for these events to start happening, right? People will not repent. They will not respond for five months. Okay, And again, we saw that before. They have a, as king over them an angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. So the angel of the bottomless pit. This is a different angel. We saw an angel come down at the beginning of the chapter with a key to open the pit, but in the pit, then, is an angel who is king with a small k. That's intentional here. So it's an angel, but not an archangel, because these are demonic forces. Okay. Um, the word, the root word from which we, the name Abaddon comes, means destruction, a place of destruction or destroyer. In Hebrew, nearly every word, every significant word has a three-letter root, three consonants. So, in Hebrew, if we were going to break a baden down to its Hebrew root, the equivalent letters would be B, D, N. And words are derived from that root that retains some degree of its meaning. So, a baden, destruction. Okay, the destroyer. Apollyon is interesting too. Apollyon is derived from a Greek word. Apollo and Apollyon both come from a Greek word that means destroyer. And I think that's interesting. Apollyon would be the word, right? The, the, would be the exact Greek equivalent, as exact as you can get, but would be the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word, Abaddon. But Apollo is derived from the same Greek word, a name of one of the Greek gods, the messenger god, if memory serves. And that might be just kind of a derogatory reference to some of the emperors, Caligula and Nero. They like to appear in public dressed as Apollo. Domitian wanted people to um, speak to him and treat him as if he were Apollo incarnate, okay? So the idea that the emperor is, you know, to, wants to be worshipped as a god. Interesting, too, that the locust was one of the symbols of Apollo because it moves so fast, right? It moves so fast. So uh, maybe an offhand reference here. Uh, so then, all right, verse 12, the first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still to come. Ooh, that's just all we just talked about in those 11 verses is the aftermath of the blowing of the fifth trumpet. What's happened between five and six. So in the sixth trumpet, now we have, it says, two woes are still to come. Okay, two woes. You think things are bad now? Wait. They're about to get worse. And the two woes correspond to the two trumpets yet to be sounded. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, 
and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God. All right, so we're going to stop mid-sentence. That's okay. Look at the first phrase. What is this voice? It could be the prayers of the martyrs. It could be the voice of the angel priest that we saw in the last chapter. But it's direction, right? Where it's coming from indicates the ultimate source. It could be the voice of the martyr, the prayers of the martyrs, the voice of the angel priest, the voice of God, all mixed together. But we know that those martyrs are beneath the altar or around the altar. So it may be implying, uh, I think, that the prayers of the faithful play an active role in the drama. Because again, they're crying out, how long, O Lord, how long? Okay? And God keeps saying, soon, more needs to happen, right? The voice comes from the four horns of the golden altar before God. And when you see horns, the word horns of the altar, think of the uh, projections at the four corners of a, of a shaped altar, right? That, that symbolized all kinds of things, but practically speaking, helped hold the sacrifice in place as it was being burned. The horns also symbolize divine protection. But in this case, right, connected, contextualizing it, divine retribution comes from God. And the point that the narrative makes all over the place in Revelation is that this retribution is deserved, not arbitrary. Okay? That's one of the things that people struggle with. It's one of the things that atheists have struggled with. Right? Well, why does God have the right to do these things? These things happen and God causes them or doesn't prevent them, then for he is not worthy to be God and I'm not going to worship him. Well, okay, that's your right. You can do that. But the whole notion here is that humankind, right, deserves these things. God has the right to punish those who reject his sovereignty and his love. He has the right to do that. Because that's why he made us, to acknowledge him and to love him. Okay? So what happens to those who don't? Oh, you know, God should just say, oh, well, it's okay. Really? Okay. The Israelites wouldn't have respected it, didn't respect God when they thought he wasn't punishing them okay, for what they'd done wrong. So the voice saying to the angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So now we know what that voice is. Ultimately, the voice of God. So the sixth angel does something different, sounds the trumpet, releases the angels. Okay, Who are these angels? Not entirely clear. Nowhere mentioned in other apocalyptic literature. But... In that literature, there is a mention of four destructive powers connected to the four points of the compass, four corners of the earth. The purpose of these, these powers, right? And these powers must be held back. So what holds them back? Well, angels. So there's a possibility, or you can make a connection, that these angels are holding back chaos, okay? Holding back chaos. Chaos. In this case, they appear to control the demonic horses that are about to be released on the earth. Okay. Now, interesting. Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Wow, that shows up a, a fair amount in Scripture. But it harkens back to the ancient promise, first in Genesis 15, 18, then in Deuteronomy 11, 24, and then in Joshua 1, 4, at the beginning of the conquest. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Okay, from the Nile to the Euphrates in Genesis 15, a large amount of territory. Every place on which you, the sole of your foot treads shall, 
every place on which the sole of your foot tread shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the Lebanon and from the river, the river Euphrates, to the western sea. So, again, talking about this huge swath of land that Israel was to possess. Joshua 1.4, from the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. So from east to west, from the Jordan to the coast, okay, shall be yours. And the Euphrates, it shows up a fair amount again in Scripture. It marked the boundary between Israel and her primary enemies in the land and was also the eastern boundary of the Roman Empire, which I think is interesting, okay? Uh, Rome expanded all the way across the land of Canaan to the Euphrates. So, verse 15, the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now, were released, past preparation for a specific moment of time, had been prepared. Their preparation had been, already had been complete, and they were simply waiting, okay? So that tells us that God is sovereign over human history. He has all things prepared, right? Already prepared for what he plans to do. Not making up things as he goes along. So the idea is that these uh, angels were ready to go from the moment of their creation preparation. And I love that phrase, the day, literally for the hour and a day and a month and a year, right? So talking, it's definite as opposed to indefinite, and the King James is correct, to talk about a specific moment in time for which these things have been prepared. And they were released by the angel to kill a third of mankind by the angels. So we have torment for a brief period to engender repentance. Once that period is over, then death comes. So we saw as the fourth seal was broken, one-fourth of mankind was put to death. As the The sixth trumpet is sounded, one-third will die. Now, don't worry about trying to do the math because it probably won't add up to your satisfaction. Think again that some are spared. Not everybody will die. And again, the use of the word mankind indicates that believers will be watching these events unfold, not suffering from them. Okay? This idea of divine protection, not just to protect, again, but for a purpose, right? Believers have a purpose to serve in these days of torment. You know, let's talk about this army, right? The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. Now, the phrase is myriads of myriads. And you can see that the ESV, the English Standard Version, as as, as well as other versions... Define a myriad as 10,000. So they translate the phrase 10,000 times 10,000, which gives us a number, right? But that's not the intent of the scripture. The intent of the scripture is not to give us an exact number, but to convey or express the idea of an army so large it can't be counted, okay? And if it can't be counted, it can't be countered. Right? So there's nothing we'll be able to do to counter this army. So it will strike terror in the hearts of human beings. Okay? Then John says, I love this last part, I heard their number. I heard their number. Now you can translate that, I'll give it to you, a couple of different ways. You can say you know, that God has given John, the number, exactly how many. And the only way he can describe it is myriads of myriads. But it could also convey the sense of this sound that's so huge and loud and great that it conveys the sense of an uncountable army. 
Okay. I heard the number. It could be a po poetic way of saying it was so loud there was no way to grasp it or comprehend it. Okay. Verse 17, and this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. So now this is an army. They wore breastplates the color of fire and sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads. And fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. All right, so take a look. Breastplates the color of fire and sapphire and sulfur. Smoke coming or something coming out of the, the, the mouths of these things. Fire, smoke, and sulfur. Okay. In my vision, he said, I saw. That reminds us that, again, to, to make a, you can draw a literal picture of this, but you're missing the point if you do that. Because, again, it's what do these things symbolize? In my vision, I saw. This is how I saw. Okay? What he's trying to do is say, I'm trying to describe to you what I saw in my vision. It's very interesting and very important to do that. Will they literally look like this? I mean, could be. But what do these things symbolize, right? They wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. So the corresponding colors of these elements is red and blue and yellow. Okay, sulfur and brimstone are equivalent given that they are essentially understood to be the same color. Okay. And, and as with the locusts and their lion's teeth, the image of the lion's head is one of cruelty and destruction, okay? And there's an intentional connection here, as I pointed out, I hope, already, between the color of the breastplates worn by the riders and what comes out of the mouth of the horses. Together they form this destructive force. They can't be separated. Now, the combination of these aspects of the description points to a demonic origin. Why do I say that? Because we have to be careful, right? Um, the fire, smoke, and brimstone foreshadow the fate that awaits the devil and those who serve him in chapter 20. But we have to understand that fire is both a positive and negative symbol in the Bible. It can be used to speak of destruction, and it can be used to speak of purification. Okay, In the New Testament, Right in the in Acts chapter two, fire becomes a or is a symbol of the divine presence, as indeed it was in the temple. Okay, so all those things, you know, they mix together. By these three plagues, fire, smoke, sulfur, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. So what does that mean? Well, it's destructive power. Right, reminds us of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis nineteen. Then the Lord rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Okay, So Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed in punishment, but that destruction was a warning to all who witnessed it or heard about it. Okay, that, hope that makes sense? It's not just punishment. It's like we, we, think, of, we think of punishment as a deterrent to crime. Doesn't always work, but that's the theory, right? For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. Now, wow, okay? So by the power of their mouths they kill, by the power of their tails they wound. Hmm, isn't that interesting? So judgment and warning two separate powers two separate outcomes the horses mouths bring death their tails bring harm again they look like can you imagine a horse with a tail that looks like a venomous snake wow okay and we have to understand the equation here that from the earliest part of the Bible, the serpent is associated with demonic origin or purpose, a bad purpose. We see it played out, right? 
And the story, I think it's in Numbers, where the people cry out to God because they complain against Moses. They complain against God. And God sends a plague of serpents to bite the people. And they start dying and they cry out. And Moses goes to God and God says, take a serpent and make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole so that the people who look at it will be healed. So it's both a, the serpent becomes both a symbol of death or wounding and a symbol of health and healing. See how it can get confusing? So you got to link these things together, but ancient literature often links serpents with demons, right? Or with deities. It's just, it's just really interesting. A snake gets a bad rep. But the overall image of a, is of a vast army before no, whom no one can survive without divine protection. This army will run roughshod over humanity and the believers will be spared. The rest of mankind who, did not, who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. I love it. The rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues. So the idea is that seeing this death and destruction around them, those who survive it should turn to God, but they don't. They, like Many atheists, they say, I will not worship a God who lets these things happen or who causes these things, which just belies any attempt to understand why these things are happening, right? Or even within the context of Revelation, why God has the right to do it. Because again, we get caught up in this notion that for us, death is the end of everything, but that's not God's perspective, okay? This perspective that there should, if a, that a good God should not allow suffering to happen. But God doesn't cause all suffering. Okay? And I love that word, right? Um, you know, do not, uh, they do not repent of the works of their hands or give up worshiping these idols. We worship the things we make because we can make them the way we like them and understand them. And we do this all the time, even if we don't actually make an image. We create in our minds an image of God and then decide whether or not we like it. That's the problem. That's an idol, right? But these things have no power. There you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. All the way back in Deuteronomy, God's like, I know what you're going to do. You're going to do these things that I've told you not to do because you're stubborn. You're disobedient. You're stiff-necked. I love that phrase the Bible uses, that one, stiff-necked. Stiff-necked people. Uh, in Psalms, right? Psalm 115. This is this is good. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throats. Now that's a lot. I mean, a big description. But what does it say? These things don't exist. The things we worship have no power other than the power we give them. We worship a lot of things in this world. It's to worship something is to give it your, the fullness of your devotion and attention apart from God or over and above God. What's more important in your life, right? So in Revelation, we get the very clear understanding that sin is the deliberate determination to rebel, to know the right path, and to choose not to do it, to take it, right? To know the right way and refuse to follow it okay nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or their thefts so we tie all the way back to the commandments which you know thou shalt not but we forget that that's only 10 of the 613 laws commandments and prohibitions many of which say thou shalt thou sh you shall do okay this is what you should do if you want to live a full and fulfilling life, and this is what you should avoid. 
the shalls outnumber the shall nots, but we don't, we like get caught up in why wow, you can't tell me what to do, right? The sixth, seventh, and eighth commandments you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. That seems self evident. Sorcery. What is sorcery? Sorcery suggests that there are other powers upon which I can rely instead of God. It's one of the works of the flesh in Galatians 5. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. I love that word, obvious, right? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. <laughs> I love Paul's lists. It's like, you should know better. That's the point. So, as we, we come to the end of this chapter, what we see is a picture of humanity in, 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 in complete, deliberate, persistent, stubborn, knowing rebellion against God. Essentially saying to God, you can't tell me what to do. You have no authority over me. Right? And we just want God to say, oh, well. But a just God can't do that, okay? And still be worshipped, still be honored, right? It's amazing the freedoms we want to give ourselves and how we want to limit God's freedom. That's idolatry, okay? So um, through all this, right, where is the church? Where are the believers? They are watching. They are waiting. They are prepared. They are ready for those who will see these things as the warnings they're intended to be and turn back to God under the guidance of believers, right? So as we continue to move through this fairly lengthy interlude, we're going to see things ratchet up. But again, as it gets worse, so it will get better. So hang in there, and we're going to get through this all together. And I hope this has made some sense as we've run through it. But let's uh, close uh, with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. I thank you for your word, for revelation, Lord, and the things we're able to learn through it about how to live our lives out today. Lord, knowing that this is not just about the future, Lord, and even not primarily about the future, but primarily about the present, how we live out our faith today. So may we be diligent in our desire to obey you and live according to your laws, for that is the best life, life that you have designed us to live. For I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. So hope that so hope at least a little bit of that made sense, um, but we'll pick up with chapter 10 in the next edition. For now, though, may God bless you.